uh, president of all and delighted to see so many of you here in attendance and those of you that are online today we're pleased to welcome bill houston who is the guru of all things sinkholes or karsts and we're i'm, I'm gonna, embarrassed already we're going to learn a lot about uh, about karsts today and then i would remind you that next week at this time we'll have an on-site visit and i'm sure you'll talk to us Correct. about yes about i that. will okay bill it's up to you thank Welcome. you thank you good morning everybody i, I greatly appreciated the write-up i enjoyed that very much um just to give you a little more background um the reason that i i like to spend so much time out in the woods working on sinkholes uh, doing things for Audubon, et cetera, is that I had cancer, came down with that, throat cancer, thyroid, um, one year after I retired in 05. And um, they scheduled me for four surgeries. And after the second surgery, I told Paul Huff, the surgeon, just to put in a zipper so he wouldn't have to open me up all the time. So uh, they wanted to prescribe medication, you know, sedatives because I'm hyper and, you know, for the pain and all that. And I just walked, I hiked, I kayaked, I fished, I did everything outdoors and never filled one of the prescriptions. Uh, I just, I think that's the way to go. It'll make us all live longer. Uh, based on the size of the group, usually when it's uh, larger, I pass around a basket and have you put in your keys. And if you get 80% on the multiple choice test, which is on the last page, uh, I'll give you your car keys. And then, George, if I don't live up to your expectations, you know, you know where my car keys are. Okay. 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 So basically, um, I enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, I know as much as I do, which is not everything, but I know people who can answer a lot of questions. But some questions that we don't know is, how does the water actually drain from the various sinkholes? Where does it go? We don't know about Native Americans in what part they play. Do they go into the sinkholes? Uh, I can state this for a fact that two winters ago when we were uh, skiing and snowshoeing around um, Stevens Twin Sinks, there were deer tracks, an actual trot in the winter. This is like January, beginning February, down into the South Sinkhole. Now, why would a deer want to go down there? I have no idea at all, but it's just one of the neat things that just keeps us going. Um, the other thing that I'd like you to remember is we're going to talk about layers of limestone. And please remember that Travis is above Detroit. And that'll make more sense when I get into the rest of the presentation. Uh, as far as the groups that I belong to, there are 10 altogether. But the one that I'm most interested in today is the Michigan Cars Conservancy. We're a 5013C. And we own several pieces of property. Uh, we own the Fiborn Preserve up by Trout Lake. And if you have any questions about that, George was recently up there helping me uh, repair the damage from the I'll use the term quad tards, illegal riding, and those that damage uh, the preserve. And then in this area, we have the Thunder Bay Karst Preserve, which includes Brewski, Stevens Twin Sinks, and also Mystery Valley. The Fiborn Preserve is about 500 acres. Mystery Valley is about 76. Stevens is about 30, and Brewski is about two and a half. Uh, I'm the property manager for, excuse me, for the Thunder Bay Cars Preserve, which is Brewski and also uh, Stevens and then also Mystery Valley. And Paul uh, Johnson, who lives in Tennessee, is the manager for um, Michigan Cars, uh, excuse me, for Fiborn. So if you just go online and go to www.caves.org, our website will come up or just do a general search okay, for um, sinkholes, caves, northeast, or northeast Michigan. Now, one other thing, um, and I don't know how best to do this. How many of you have your phones today on you right now? Okay, um, this is gonna 
change a, a little bit, Ron, but would you turn on your phones, please? I know this is unusual, and I'm not taking up time because I have more than enough to do, but if you turn on your phone and go to 9 and 10 news, and then do a search for Mystery Valley, a drone video is going to come up. And that drone video is when Corey Adkins filmed me at Mystery Valley. Because for the last 10 years or so, what I've been doing, I shouldn't say 10, nine years, uh, I go to Mystery Valley in my kayak and I take depth surveys. And on that occasion, and tell me when it comes up, um, we had measurements of 28 feet of water. When he came back the following year, when I was standing on the shore and I reached up with my paddle, I could not touch the seaweed and algae that was still on the limbs of the trees. That's how deep the water was. And what's interesting is that, and I'm sort of getting ahead of myself, but I'll, I'll get back onto the point, that at Mystery Valley, uh, it was filled with water from 2016 all the way through uh, this last, uh, I'll say, November, December of 20. Now, how do I know that? On, in January, with my sled and my life vest on and a two by four by six, I walked out and I did this during when it, I knew it had water and I used my auger and I checked the depth. This time when I went out, I got out about 20 feet and I went straight on through, no water. So, you know, I did one of these routines <laughs> and went back on shore. And as I looked back out over Mystery Valley, I could see that the ice was concave. So that when I came back, and it was luckily there was a lot of heating days in there, when I came back in March to do another drone and survey, there was absolutely no water in there. And we had always thought that the water was being held in Mystery Valley because Lake Huron was so high. Well, starting last fall, Lake Huron levels started to go down and all our water drained out. So uh, somebody has water from, uh, I'll call it a, a reservoir, that is about a half mile in length, an eighth to a quarter mile in width, and at some points, 28 feet deep. That's a lot of water. But on some of these um, displays that I have, there are pictures of that, and you can look at those later. Uh, there's, it's right down there, the second one down there. But I've used the word karst, K-A-R-S-T. That comes from an area in Europe, Yugoslavia, all the way over to the Adriatic Sea, part of the Italy complex. In the States, we have everything from Kentucky, Tennessee, Iowa, Michigan, even a little bit into Ohio. They all have karst features. Now, what are karst? In this area, we had a series of warm seas come through and a series of glaciers, all leaving deposits. And you have to think of this, and this is another concept that I'm going to have to try and get across to you. We're talking about glaciers that are two miles high. So you can imagine how much weight they had to compress all of the deposits from the warm seas. And um, I spend a lot of time birding out at Partridge Point, but the other thing is I always walk up and down the shores. Uh, this last time there were four tires left from the, uh, the mudders. I got those out, but at the same time, I was able to find a lot of these fossil samples, and I'll pass this around. I normally carry a spray bottle with water, and I spray it, and then the fossils stand out. So back to what our cars are, et cetera. So you have all of the warm seas, they're depositing the fossils, the minerals, et cetera. They're being compact. And you have two layers. You have the Travers group, which is the top layer. And then you have the Detroit group, which is eight to 900 feet below us. Now, Rogers City 
it's only probably somewhere between two and 300, but it, it just depends, you know, in that area. Um, how do we know a karst area? If any of you've walked on the high country trail out of Atlanta going over to the Pigeon River, um, along that trail, you can just see a lot of areas where they're, they look like they're holes, we call those swallow holes, where the water collects, it percolates down through that, and as it does, just like when it comes out of the, the sky or from clouds, et cetera, that it becomes more acidic. So if you put something that's acetic on limestone, it begins to dissolve it. And as it dissolves, you get uh, caves, you get caverns, you get cracks, you get fissures, all sorts of karst features. You can't see them all, but they're there. Now, how do we know that they're there? Got to make sure I get the right one. This is a LIDAR photograph of Stevens, Twin Sinks, and also Brewski. Now this was taken by a drone, so you're up above. It sends various, various types of signals down, and then it captures the return signals, and you get something like this. So in other words, it went from the top to 90 degrees on the side. So that um, Stevens is twin sinks. There are the twin sinks. And this is Brewski over here. These are some of the technologies that we're beginning to use to explore sinkholes. I've got a lot of drone footage uh, that we've had. And it's very helpful. Some of the new drone footage, especially from Mystery Valley, allowed us to see new swallow holes, new earth cracks, all sorts of things. And now I'm going to get back to what I was going to do. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the background. Did anybody, uh, did, were you able to bring up that video? No? No, but I'm kind of agreeing with you. I've got no. it, it came up? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay. So you can just, you don't want to get a chance at home, go look at it. There's probably, Corey and I did three. Um, one had to do um, with river restoration, where it's a group that works out of uh, Long Rapids. And our goal is to try and keep the Thunder Bay River free for kayakers, fishermen, et cetera. So we got a grant to get a boat. We go out on the uh, river and we use chainsaws, et cetera, and winches to pull the logs up and out and so kayakers can use it. But when Corey was doing that, he found out about that. And then I said, well, Corey, how about coming out to the sinkholes and let's do some more. So that's what we did. Okay, so I did that, that, dry sinks, we did that. Okay, next thing is this. And this is something I should have included. Um, Roger City. This is the depths of various layers, the Traverse, and then also the Detroit group. Rogers City, it's 100 feet below. Alpena, 900. Uh, Empire, way over by Traverse City, et cetera, is 1,300. And I'm gonna include this in the next presentation I do. Before you leave today, I really wish you'd spend some time looking at these. I know that they're not, um, how should I say it? Uh, professionally done, okay? Uh, but there are just some concepts that I'd like you to see, okay? And the reason I want you to see that is I really want you to get out and visit them, okay? Instead of going home and sitting in the TV playing with the remote, you know, just go out. It's beautiful. It's best to go in the fall and early spring because you don't have the leaves. In the fall, you also have bird migrations. And out at Mystery Valley, had red start palm warblers, uh, a green-throated black war warbler. I think that was the one that was identified. Uh, just all sorts of things. So I did the mud. I did the compaction. We saw that I, you heard that. Precipitation I did. OK, now, the hardest thing that you have to conceptualize is that 
Some sinkholes are dry. They don't contain any water except, you know, natural water that comes in from rain and precipitation. You have other sinkholes that are watered filled. These are various types of lakes. If you go to C, which I don't have, and you go on the back, no, excuse me, it's on the front. If you look at this on the left and go down where it says drainage events, Rainy Lake, which is off towards 33, has, has drained four times completely. And if you go online and search for Rainy Lake, uh, sinkholes, etc., there are pictures of the locals who own properties, cabins in that area, they thought when the water would drain out, it would leave all the fish. It left some, of course, but the rest actually followed the water down into the, um, the drainage channels. Shoe Pack is drained at least three times. And if you go over on the right-hand side in the middle column, those are the sinkhole lakes that are in um, Pigeon River area. And then in Presque Isle, there are Francis, Kelsey, Tomahawk, Big Tomahawk, um, Rainy, and also Shoepack and um, Rainbow. Now, sinkhole lakes can also be classified. And if I sort of regress, those of you that are going to go on the tour of the sinkholes, when we're at Stevens, that is very unique because it has a fragile ridge, an actual earth separation between the two sinkholes. We also have, though, sinkhole lakes that are walled. There's one in Pigeon River area, but that's separated by probably maybe an eighth of a mile. You have Rainbow Lake, which is off of Millersburg, which is maybe separated from a, by 100 feet. So you have all sorts of variations. But what's so interesting about this is Shoepack Lake, which is probably 170 where the one sinkhole was, or the new sinkhole, right to the east of that, you have five dry sinkholes that are deeper than the lake. So why doesn't the water go from the lake into the dry sinkholes? There is a clay ridge right there that separates them. So all the drainage events have happened when material has slid off the side down into the lake, and that material is following the actual collapse of the area down below. Now, what you have to think of is this. You have the Travis group up here. 800 feet below, you have the Detroit group. And you have water seeping down. It's acetic. It's dissolving the various types of limestone, gypsum, dolomite, etc. Now, when you have a sinkhole, you can think of it as a funnel. This is the Travis group. Excuse me. Yes, Travis group. This completely drops down, as an example, right into that. And down here is the Detroit group. So what you see is this shape on the surface, a cone. In the case of Mystery Valley, you had a huge cavern, which was almost an eighth of a mile in width. And depending on the water, et cetera, the level, it could be up to a half mile in length. That whole roof collapsed. So you don't have just a circular cone. You've got this huge valley. And that is right over there. And I have pictures of it showing not only when it contained water, but also when it was dry. Now, another interesting thing about Mystery Valley, Ron, I'm gonna cruise this way for a minute. The water was retained in Mystery Valley so long that fish came into the, um, into the waters. Now, you've gotta remember that these fish probably 
the eggs were hatched, the eggs were previously fertilized, they were picked up on the feet of ducks, blue herons, maybe the seagulls, they were deposited in the water, and that's how the fish got there. So I'll just pass this around. And it shows the depth, it shows the moss on the, uh, the various trees, etc. It's and you and this is public. You can walk in there. Um, George knows how hard we uh, we work keeping the the trails clear. Even when we have you know a windstorm and blowdown, usually within a day or two, I'm able to go back in and start clearing trees. So it's a lot of fun. It's good to have a friend and a good worker. Okay, um, did that. Earth cracks, another favorite topic. And this is the third word, slumping, S-L-U-M-P-I-N-G. What happens is that there is a constant pull by the material that has dropped into the bottom of the sinkhole to pull the sides in. And what happens is that in limestone, it actually splits or cracks. And when we go to Mystery Valley, you're going to see cracks that are probably 15 feet deep. In some cases, they're wide enough for a body. And I'm going to go back over that in a minute. And they're covered with different types of mosses, liverworts, ferns, etc. And we have all sorts of signs saying, do not enter. Because if you enter, then you chance pulling some of the mosses down, some of the ferns down. And that's taking away the, uh, how should I best say it, J just the, the splendor of it. it. On the right day, with the sun shining in there and the green moss, it is, you can't capture it on a camera. You, you have to e experience it. And of course, once you get you know, mosses and everything, then you get grubs and you get worms and you get insects, you get snails, then you get the small little squirrels and all those. Foxes, yes. Bear, yes. We found piles of bear poop. And it, it's just a neat place to explore. Um, one of the pages that you have, um, B, two sides all about earth cracks. This side and then obviously on the back. So I'm not going to go over all that. You can, you can read that. But the other important thing is this. Those of you that are familiar with the area, if you go out Misery Bay Road to North Point Road, you take a left, and you go down maybe a mile or so on the right-hand side, the DNR has two posts and then a gate. Park your car, walk in, and I've not received permission yet from DNR to put a sign up that says, Earth Cracks with an Arrow. But if you go down that trail, you're going to see a path off to the right-hand side that's maybe three-quarters of the way down there. Those earth cracks, you can actually walk in. But some of them are 20 feet high. In some cases, they're maybe five or six feet in width. And they're pretty safe to walk in, but they're totally impressive. Now, that's on the north side of Elka John Bay. Elka John Bay has three sinkholes, and then on the south side of Elka John Bay, that's the Alpena Township Nature Center. And if you haven't been there, we have a new parking lot, we took out the old gate, we put in new boulders to block all the quad tards from going down in there. And I, I hope I'm not offending you, but I have a, um, how should I say it, George? <laughs> My blood pressure goes up when I hear the sound of that because there's been so much damage. So that in the south side, on the south side of Elka John Bay, we also have earth cracks. However, there, I would can say, say that they're in the primitive stage because there's not a sharp break. It's just that there's, you can see there's an opening and then it's covered by forest floor material. So you know they're there, you know they're coming, they're just not ready. And what's so different about that is, 
how it compares and contrasts so greatly from the sinkholes that are on the north side, the DNR land, okay? Um, we have brochures at the uh, Alpena Township Nature Preserve. Um, around May 22nd or 23rd is the best time to go because you have um, dwarf lakeside um, or dwarf um, daisy irises, thank you. I'm thinking of uh, lakeside daisies because we're doing an experiment with those up at, uh, up at Fiborn. Okay, if you now go to A, what I did was I saved you about two weeks worth of driving and looking, et cetera. Um, I start with Misery Bay and Elka John. There's also all sorts of current information about Middle Island and the sinkholes and the vents that are there. That exploration is being done by uh, Wayne and Stephanie and the divers, and also uh, from Grand Valley State, Bopai, et cetera. And what they're, what they're looking at is purple mats, they're sort of purple and white, that form near the vents. And I've got to regress again. Um, in, in my mind, you always think of humans living because of oxygen and photosynthesis and green plants. But before all those things were ever here, you had other types of organisms, bacteria in this example, that would convert maybe sulfide, sulfates, and their byproduct would be oxygen. So that some of the researchers, in terms of these purple mats, think maybe that's the first time that oxygen was produced here on Earth, maybe 2.4 million years ago or so. I mean, I was born in 43, I can't go back that far, but you know, I gotta deal with that. So that's another way to look at it. And I think most of us in this room have been to the Alpena Library, and you've gone to the fountain, and what odor do you smell there? Sulfur, okay. Now, remember sulfur is one of the byproducts of dissolving limestone. If you go to El Kajan Bay, when they did the water sampling, it was the same as in the fountain. So there is somewhat of a connection. Now, we don't know where all the connections are. All sorts of rumors. Oh, my grandfather's grandfather poured blue dye in the toilet and he flushed it. Oh no, that was an outhouse back then. So he put it in and it ended up in my neighbor's yard and all that. Um, checking with Ty uh, Black, who is a retired state geologist, a good friend, and works with us at the sinkholes. To his knowledge, there's not been any specific attempt to trace dyes, excuse me, to trace the water flow with dyes, either with various types of ra uh, radioactive materials or colored dyes, etc. cetera. Um, he does not have a record, he has no knowledge of that. So that's one of the rumors that I'm always looking for, how should I say it, possible um, incidences where people maybe have tried it. Um, we know through health, to county, health County records that back in the 60s, there was an issue in Posen and maybe in Hawks in, in that area uh, where there was an epidemic of uh, dysentery, et cetera. And what happened was that when Obviously, they didn't have septic systems back then. But when uh, those bacteria, viruses, et cetera, got into the groundwater through the, um, the outhouses, et cetera, uh, it spread. And it was just like one of the plumes for the um, PFAS, how it spread out through the community. They could almost trace you know, the people that came down with it because of where they were located in terms of the plume. So we know there's water flowing. Do we know where it's flowing? That's one of the big questions. There's been a lot of discussion of the water coming on Long Lake, going into Lake Huron, and whether or not there are uh, vents or there are earth cracks or there are sinkholes, all sorts of things. Some rumor, some fact. And my greatest concern is, and, and I don't know how to say this nicely is, 
that there are restrictions put on employees when they belong to an organization, uh, specifically with the DNR, the state, Eagle, etc. In other words, they can only do things, let's say their research, uh, on the, um, the marine sanctuary. They can't go out with me to Mystery Valley and do research out there because it's not in the sanctuary. Okay, so there are limitations, and I wish they would just sort of open that up more. That would really help. Okay, next thing is Brewski and Stevens. Now, this is off Lear Road. You go out Long Rapids to 65, you turn right, that's heading north. First road on your left is Lear. Follow that for four miles. Brewski's on your right, and Stevens is on your left. We have parking in both places, but I recommend that you go to Stevens because it has the kiosk and more information. Now, Brewski was bought way back in, I think, 87. The um, Cars Conservancy um, got grants. They were able to work on the, I'll say, the cleaning or extraction of the materials that had been dumped for years into Brewski. Um, they got a crane and an operator from um, Tom Moran's place. Uh, the crane operator uh, gingerly placed uh, these large containers in the bottom of the sinkhole. This is Brewski. And they were able to extract at least what I've heard a minimum of eight cars. They never found Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> Tractors, 55 gallon barrels, um, just all sorts of stuff. Um, and they did that for about five years. They took out 27 feet of trash. So Brewski is 27 feet deeper, but you'll be able to see that when you go out there. And some of that information is right in here. Right uh, across the street from Brewski, you have Stevens Twin Sinks. Absolutely a marvelous place. We have nature trails, we have um, natural features trails, and we have the earth crack trails. So you can see it all right there. And then I would like to go on to Mystery Valley. Um, trying to think of, here it is, right here. Now, this is a specialized drone shot of Mystery Valley. Black and white with a little blue tinge, obviously, but showing you the features. This right here at this end is where the swallow hole is. Now, over a period of years, what they've had is this. Way back in the 40s and 50s, they tried to make it into an amusement area with tourists, etc. And I'm trying to figure out which diagram that is. No, it's on the back of one. Excuse me, Ron, I'm not making your day any easier, am I? Oh, it's right here behind me. Shoot. Okay. So they actually had um, places for tables and grills. There was a, um, how should I say it, fossil hunting area, etc. They also have an arch or had, and you can still go out there and see that. Okay, now Ron, is there a chance we could take a break? Okay, thank you for your patience. It is, it is warm. I'm not even wearing long underwear. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, so Mystery Valley. Uh, make sure that you look at the video, 9 and 10 News. Uh, there have been other groups that have tried it. Uh, Night Stalkers did. We had great weather. Video was great. Guess what? No audio. 
It was just, you know, one of those things. So please take advantage of this. Um, you can make copies. And basically what I did was that uh, did a little research, got out the maps, and did the driving. And as I said, that was about two weeks worth of work, get the GPS points, et cetera, but took care of it. Now, another interesting thing is about cars. You have cars running from Traverse City all the way over to Alpena out into Lake Huron. Between these red lines, and this is something that I'm still working on, that was the document uh, C that I told you about, that this is the area where you have uh, all of most of the sinkholes and most of the sinkhole lakes, Francis Lake, Big Tomahawk, etc. So if you get a map out, and this one I think was the Alpena Chamber of Commerce, it actually shows you the sinkholes. So it's a good map to get. Okay, I did earth cracks. You can read that on your own. And I did see. Now, part of the planning that I do is that between May and October of each year, uh, I get volunteers, George is one, uh, and, but we go out more than just on weekends. Usually the first weekend in each of those months, except in September when it's the second weekend because of the Posen Festival. Uh, we paint signs, we keep up with the, um, the vandalism, which unfortunately some has occurred, um, clear the trails, uh, we're trying to get wood chips. Um, we spent, I don't know how many hundreds of dollars to put boulders in the parking lot so that the four wheelers, et cetera, don't go up the hills. Um, but it's really something that you should go out and see, okay? Um, I don't know how many of you signed up for the tour, which is a week from today, but we're going to meet at Stevens at 10. Um, I'll try and keep it short at Brewski and Stevens because at Mystery Valley, I have the combination so we can drive in and park, but then we've got to walk the two trails. But once again, it, it's well worth it. The important thing to sort of conceptualize in your mind is that at Mystery Valley, at the West End, you have this swallow hole. And it was hard for me to understand at the beginning that the swallow hole in Mystery Valley has water coming up as well as going down, its resurgence. And that's why over a period of years, water would bring, come up in the spring and then it would gradually lessen. And by fall, we could actually mow a path through the grass out to the swallow hole so that the visitors could actually come and see it. It is absolutely neat. Um, the other thing that probably is so unique is that just across Rear, Lear Road, you have Mud Lake, which is another sinkhole lake to some degree, because it does not vary in depth too much. However, it has drained. I think the gentleman that owns the property said it drained sometime in the 50s. So even though you have lakes uh, filled sinkholes or clap valley, claps valleys um, side by side, maybe within a mile, we still don't know where the water goes. We don't know why it comes and goes, why, and what's the best way to describe this? And what, it re, what its relationship is either with Lake Huron or the vents in Lake Huron, or the entire underground system of aquifers, which are above all of the, um, the caverns and sinkholes and the Detroit group at the bottom. Now, part of our plan is the, with the Michigan Cars Con, uh, Conservancy is that we're also looking at 
um, the sinkholes that are in Mount, Mer excuse me, in uh, Monroe County. And we're in the process of working with, um, I think it's Whitefield Township, White Ford Township, to take over one of the sinkholes there. The county doesn't want it, the road commission doesn't want it, but we raised our hands. So we're in negotiations to find out the costs and also the liability. As an example, at Fiborn up by Trout Lake, we have a cave system that with permission, and there's a lot of permissions that you have to get, you can be led in by one of our tour guides. It's 1,200 feet. Um, I did it when I was 75 and didn't have a problem. Other than my feet got cold, my knees got cold, because you're actually um, in water and it is narrow. A lot of the visitors, like this last weekend, um, we had people, students from um, Michigan Tech for Geology and then uh, Lake Superior Tech, or Lake Superior students did the cave uh, tour. And it was interesting, they've been told that when you, before you enter the cave, you have to put on a clean set of clothes and boots because we're thinking of white nose syndrome for bats and bats were in the cave. And then when you come out, you have to change again and do a separate wash and all that. Um, I think what is most interesting about the cave is that in one portion, there is like a shelf. You have the wall coming down and then a, a horizontal shelf. In that shelf, you can see all, just like the fossil piece or sample that I passed around, you can see those fossils. It is absolutely cool. And it's only maybe 50 to 60 feet underneath the surface of the, the forest floor up above. The frustrating thing is it's shiny and wet. And if you try and take a picture, um, you get reflection. You don't, you don't get any good pictures. But that is just, it's worth the trip. It's worth the trip. So that's what's new. We're, we're trying to purchase that land. Um, we're also rewriting, I shouldn't say rewriting, but we're, we're working on three documents, history of Brewski, history of Stevens, and history of Mystery Valley. And just on Mystery Valley, I think I'm up to about maybe seven or eight pages. But we go back all the way to 1869 when uh, one of the state geologists described Sunken Lake. So, you know, we've got a lot of data. Plus, um, the Alpena Library is a great source. Totally impressed with the way they answered questions, how they showed me to use the microfiche, how to print, do all that. So the research is here. The other thing is that you've got to make contacts with other interested people, like the, uh, the workers, I shouldn't say workers, but the staff at NOAA. Very, very helpful. The staff at uh, Grand Valley, very helpful. Uh, the staff at Eagle and Gaylord answer a lot of questions. They say, Houston again, nope, sorry, not home. You know, not here, I'm out of my office, you know. But you've got to ask the questions. You've got to, you know, if you want to do something like it um, at um, the DNR land north of Elk John Bay, I want to put up uh, a sign saying earth cracks with an arrow. So when you go on your walk, you won't miss it. It's, it's easy to miss. I walked right past it and then finally came back and said, no, it's got to be about here. So, you know, things like that. So, you know, and, and even if you want to go in and clear trails and do things like that, uh, since it's DNR land, you have to sign, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the volunteer form. And that's a liability form, et cetera, so that if you get cut by a chainsaw, et cetera, that you know, the DNR is not liable. But they're really good about it. They enjoy the, the help, et cetera. And after a while, they get to know you. And it's pretty easy to, uh, to do that. Now, perfect timing, 10 minutes. 
questions. Give me easy ones at first, okay? When was the Mississippi Valley purchased? Okay, we purchased that with we purchased that with um, the help of uh, the Michigan Nature Association. It was about seventy-six thousand dollars a piece, and I think that was sometime in um, eighty. No, zero eight, zero eight. But it's worth the trip. Oh, this is too easy. Come on now. I should have kept your car keys. George, you going to pass out the multiple choice test? Hi, this is uh, Olin. Can I you hear me? I definitely would like you to um, take a look at all the displays. If you have any questions, um, my card's back there. Um, you've got the brochures. You've got all of the information. And the best thing to do is just get out and take a look at them. You will become fascinated. That's, a rid, that's why I did the sinkhole trail, because I knew about Middle Island. I knew about uh, Elka John Bay. I knew about Pigeon River. Oh, Pigeon River. Um, if you go to Pigeon River, make sure that you go to DNR headquarters. It's a beautiful building. Karen Chapman's the uh, secretary there. She's there on Thursday great lady, she'll answer all your questions. And she's going to give you the information on the Pigeon River Discovery Area, which is right next door to their headquarters. And it has the history of Pigeon River. It is fascinating how it was purchased, uh, the years and years of negotiations with the drilling and oil companies and gas companies, the history of the area with loggers, uh, the history of the recreation that goes in there. Uh, we were uh, cross-country skiing out of uh, the Pigeon River Forest area, uh, the first one over the bridge. And we go down this hill and come up on the other side. And there are boy, this is the middle of winter when we're cross-country skiing, cross skiing. And there are Boy Scouts that are camping in the middle of the winter. I said, yes, it is so cool. And they That's offer this hot tea and coffee. And of course, you know, you're, they're doing the beans and hot dogs. I said, no, uh, that's okay. That's okay. I'll stick with it. Uh, this is Olin. I, I have a question. Can you hear me? Another, yes. You mentioned Monroe, like Monroe County. Is yes. Another sinkhole area down there because it seems like we're talking about sinkholes, but they all seem to be located in this area. Yes. Or the one that's up at Lake. But when, when, you, when you first, you know, like how could they be there? But look at the salt mines in Detroit, yeah. which was deposited by the warm seas. I think that the Monroe County area and the Toledo area, uh, Sylvania, I used to take the kids from class down there to fossil hunt. So I knew it was limestone area, but had no idea until uh, maybe four months ago that this complex of sinkholes actually existed. Uh, my grandson um, is out in Cedar Rapids and I was watching, I forgot which show it was, I don't have cable, I have over the air. It was, it was on 6-4, I have no idea what the program was. But it was showing um, limestone and sinkholes in an area called Driftless, which is in Iowa. So he and his girlfriend went there, they loved it. They found another place, it's called Pikes Peak in Iowa. Deep chasms worn out by, you know, limestone that had been worn away by rivers sinkholes, everything. So uh, guess where Papa Bear is going to go? <laughs> I've got an invitation, so it'll be cool. Are there any more? Yes? For hiking, do you, do you need, is it going to be muffy or wet to wear like waterproof boots or sneakers? Or what, what I, I would wear waterproof hiking boots okay. because at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, sun is not going to penetrate down far enough to evaporate all the dew and moisture. And it's going to be a rain or shine event. So if it's raining, we're still going. Okay. okay. But you'll enjoy it. Leaves are starting to drop. And that was the other thing. When I was up doing the trails uh, up by Trout Lake, it seems like the trees missed a step. They went from beautiful green to now I'm falling off. <laughs> I mean, we've got 500 acres, so I got a pretty good feel of, you know, what was going on and a lot of pines, but the poplars, et cetera. 
they've already lost their lease. As we were working on the trails, and I thought I'd have to wear my dark glasses, you know, and all that. No, it was bright and everything, and then put them back on. It was interesting. Bill? 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 Hello? Hello, Bill. Bill, this is Dean Stewart. We'd like a copy of the brochure. The question has to be, or was, how, not how, but what is the location of Stevens and Bruski to, what was the name of the property? Lumsden. Oh, Harold? I know it is, yes. Oh, okay, I know Harold, okay. Um, no, Bruski and Stevens are separated from that, except as you drive down Lear Road and look right and left, I bet you see at least five, if not six. I know there's a road that comes out on Lear right there. I think it's Inger Road, and it T-bones Lear, and if you keep going across Lear, there's three more sinkholes there. And then um, the Wongs own the property on the south side of Stevens, and there's a sinkhole there. Did that answer your question? Yes. I was thinking Stevens was across from the farmhouse there. No. I was no. 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 Thank you. Different. No. Yes, sir. Okay, the question has to do with swallow holes, whether or not divers could uh, explore those, and also whether or not there's any water motion. So let me first handle the water motion. Um, at Mystery Valley, I was told, did not see, that when water was draining through the sinkholes, that they actually saw the water rotate. I've been in there countless times and I've never seen it, so I don't know. Your question on swallow holes is that some of them might only be a foot in diameter, some of them might be 10 feet in diameter. Most of them have very small openings. I mean, maybe the size of a softball. Um, and there would be no possible chance that divers could explore those. However, divers have gone to the sinkholes that are water filled at Rockport. Um, they have done a dive at Elka John. And with the Elka John sinkhole, the three of them, the main one that Rick and his crew went down in is sort of hourglass shape like this. And our concern is the lip because they terminated the dive early because some of the diver tanks hit the sides and there was too much debris falling. So they, they terminated the dive and just went straight up. So that we're concerned that as the water level goes down in Lake Huron, and Elka John water level goes down, the people might try and walk out. And it's very, very risky. And besides that, when you walk out and it's got a, a, a mud layer, um, sort of a silt sand layer, layer and more mud, you leave tracks. And we're trying to you know, keep it as natural as possible. And my recommendation, and I haven't heard back from DNR, is that if you want to kayak it, that you transport your kayak down the DNR trail, because that side of the Elka John has a firmer shoreline and would do less damage. Elka John is this one right here. 
This is the Elka-John sinkhole. Are there any other questions? Yes. I don't know if there's any connection, but how do the sinkholes here compare to what we hear about the sudden collapsing of the in Florida? Yeah. Are they the same kind of mechanism? I think with Florida, in some cases, yes. The other case might be bad engineering and construction of sewer lines, water lines, etc. Um, Florida rests on coral, water seeps down, so you're definitely going to get, you know, dissolution of um, the limestone forming caverns, etc. Um, there are several videos showing real sinkholes where when the water goes down or drops out, it drags in trees, boats, and everything. So they do exist there. Um, I, I just did not really study to research that, but you're right, there are sinkholes. Or I, should, I should add that. That is correct. Yes. Bill? Oh, yeah. Down to this is being short. Uh, you have the louder. Not working. Yes. Right. Um, Very atypical. The the la what you might say is a lava flow, and I'm trying to think. I don't think I brought it, but when they were mining. Rockport and mining Fiborn Quarry, you can see actual lines where the various machines went through and picked up the limestone. So that was like slag or, or yes, okay. yes, or over. They, it's also or overburden where they push it aside and then mine it. Um, the Rockport, the friends of Rockport are working on a new signage system for the trails. And granted, it is a walk-in, but the thing that I talked to the DNR about was that, and I guess this is a long range plan, they want to make a, a parking lot off Grand Lake Road. There's already a parking place there, not two, a place. So you can park and walk in. Uh, I walked in and got lost. I was in for probably two hours and said, nah, this is not working. So. I have a system with flags that I walk out, and as I walk by it, I pull the flag. Uh, and I talk with them, and they're working on numbering it. There are numbered posts, but there's no map. And some of the posts have numbers, some don't. So I just terminated the hike. It was a nice day, no mosquitoes. You don't carry a compass with you, Bill? No, no. I can vouch for that. <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah. Both didn't get lost. So. Yeah. No. No. no the only questions for Bill. Bill. I can't Bill. think of a better promotional uh, program to have for the Association of Lifelong Learners than you, Bill Houston. It's an Hi. awesome presentation. I thank you very much. I appreciate and it. To the group assembled here, if you're not a member of all, uh, it's programs like Bill's that we offer um, many times a week and throughout the year. And I invite you to be a member, join our organization for a nominal fee, and um, you can hear more like this. If you're not a member today with your complimentary visit, and we do invite you to make a donation for future programs, but um, with a presentation like today, I can't imagine anybody doesn't want to be a member of this uh, super group. Bill, thank you so much for sharing. Your oh, I, I enjoyed it. It's not, it's not work. It's just a little different with the mask on and, and the temperature. Other than that, we're fine.